So today I'm hosting two guests at our Lighthouse podcast. Uh, Adriana Zahrijević, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory of the University of Belgrade, and Anna Petrovic from the organization Da Se Zna, which provides legal and psychological support uh, to the uh, LGBT plus uh, community. Uh, we will talk about the position of women an LGBT plus community in Serbia, as well as about anti-gender discourse, the so-called gender ideology, and how this discourse affects the rights and freedoms of women and LGBT plus people. Adriana Zaharijević is a senior research fellow at the University of Belgrade Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Her work combines political philosophy, gender studies and social history. She authored four books, the latest being Judith Butler and Politics, and has published in Science, European Women's Studies Journal, Women's Studies International Forum and many others. Her texts were translated into numerous languages and she herself has translated philosophy and feminist theory into Serbian. Adriana is also the proud holder of the M Emma Goldman Snowball Award. Anna Petrovic is a producer, activist and advocacy coordinator in the organization Da Se Zna, which provides support to LGBT plus community by monitoring and documenting hate crimes and discriminatory acts committed as a consequence of homophobia and transphobia and reporting the cases to the competent state authorities or independent institutions. Anna has been in media activism since 2009 and her work primarily focuses on advocacy of social changes, procedures and laws. So welcome to the Lighthouse podcast, uh, Adriana and Anna. So my first question goes to you, Adriana. So since 2017, roughly, uh, the presence of anti-gender actors and their narratives against gender equality has been clearly evident and we could even say on the rise uh, in the Serbian public discourse. Um, this trend can be traced back uh, to when a group of conservative Serbian intellectuals opposed the implementation of a national curriculum on, on the prevention of sexual violence because they perceived it as, and this is a quote, a social manual for the promotion of homosexuality, end of quote. Uh, so, Adriana, could you please explain to our listeners what is anti-gender discourse? Who are the actors promoting this type of narrative? And what do they want, in fact? First, thank you for uh, inviting me and having me here. Um, well, there is, I would say, two relatively easy answers to the question. But I would also say that there is nothing easy about mm. anti-gender. Mm. Uh, we don't know whether it's movement or it's mobilization or it's campaigns or Maybe we should talk about uh, some kind of anti-gender organizations who are articulating uh, anti-gender discourse. So basically everything is complicated, mm -hmm. apart from the fact that that, whatever that is, is working against equality mm -hmm. and the levels of emancipation already gained. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we can also say that this is a newer version or some kind of optimized version of something which we had well especially in Serbia but not only in Serbia throughout the Balkan countries mm. uh, to some extent in the 1990s as well in the Western Europe so mm -hmm. it's all of this is relatively new that the emancipation is or has been there so we can say that to an extent and the gender rides on the same wave as what used to be anti-feminist conservative or ultra-conservative mm -hmm. uh, call against extension or expansion of certain levels of freedom and equality. Mm -hmm. But I would claim that at this moment we're really witnessing something new. So there is, there is a continuity, but there is also a certain novelty, and that is that the anti-gender mobilizations, let's call it thus, that they are in fact um, using gender as a kind of symbolic glue 
Mm. This is a very nice term. I always insist, insist on it. It's uh, the coinage by the Hungarian historian Andrea Peto, who wanted to explain how now gender functions for all these various movements in societies, mm. where various struggles or various issues become glued through a notion of gender, mm. a notion which only five to six years ago was interesting and used by very uh, few individuals, mm. so primarily theorists in, in academia, or those practitioners who were trying to implement um, certain measures or laws or bylaws that would target gender equality. And you're talking now in global terms, I'm not talking, only... I'm talking in global mm -hmm. terms, but it's also applicable to us here. But what happened in five, six, seven All years ago? All of a sudden, ago? you know, gender appeared as a kind of... Uh, as a kind of some monstrous entity mm -hmm. which threatens the common people uh, more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's how this gender becomes as I said, symbolic glue, which somehow uh, binds all different kinds of anxieties that we have produced by very different political, economic, social movements, mm. whatever is happening in the world. But that's not what is really the issue. The mm. issue is this gender and gender stands for a certain kind of attack on the um, on the values, the traditional values, the natural order, uh, the family and the children. So all that is very important or the most important or should be most important to the common man. Mm, because so, yes, they talk about this quote unquote gender ideology. Uh, what do they mean by this when they talk about this? Yeah, gender ideology became a very important, prominent uh, term all of a sudden really all of a sudden in the last, let's say, five, seven, eight years. I mean, we are really talking about the phenomenon that started at the, at the start of 2010s, but mm -hmm. then developed in different places in the different times. Mm -hmm. It referred at the start um, to um, what we call gender studies, uh, more, which is a more precise reference to that big corpus of theories uh, referring to it as something which is gender theory or more precisely gender ideology implying mm. that whatever wants to present itself as gender studies is in fact an ideological artifice which is used to in fact politically socially engineer the social tissue so it has in some ways at its, at its basis presumably some sort of a conspiracy theory because uh, uh, it presumes that all this kind of is coordinated leading to some goal, right? Absolutely, yeah. very much so. Uh, one of the biggest troubles for anyone who does, who wants to approach this issue from some kind of theoretical perspective is that wherever you go and however you approach it, in the end, you are always faced with some kind of conspiracy theory. Mm. Uh, but yes, there is really, uh, there is this notion that there is some center of power from which this idea, this gender ideology is being disseminated. Mm. And then that center of power moves. It can be Washington, it can be Brussels. Uh, it, it's, it's always somewhere where the, the big power is. And somehow the idea is that we, or our traditional values, mm. we are colonized. Right, right. We are in, imposed mm. that mm. as, as a... We'll, we'll come back to mm. that. I have many questions on that, on that <laughs> particular imagine. point. I want to go to Anna, uh, uh, because as we heard, uh, anti-gender um, um, discourse is uh, directed mainly uh, against women and LGBT plus communities. So um, the social media are filled with examples of such narrative and... Uh, but can you please tell us what does, how does this look in practice, in fact, uh, in the real world? Uh, how does this discourse in the Serbian media um, and on social networks impact the rights and security of the LGBT plus 
community in this country? Uh, first of all, thank you for having us today here and uh, uh, thank you for bringing this, uh, this theme up because there is, I think, um, not a lot of space for us to talk about uh, these important questions. Uh, when it comes to LGBT plus community, uh, the attack of anti-gender movement uh, is not just on the queer women, it's on the whole community. Yes. Because the hate speech and the hate uh, and discrimination in community uh, we facing together, we are together in our fights, then we should be together in this um, particularly hard questions for the women, but for the trans women mostly. When it comes to whole community, we have an informal groups, individuals, of course, who are gathering around uh, uh, those attacks on uh, trans women and on the whole community, uh, openly on social media. Uh, and uh, the consequences are really terrible. We had um, uh, tragic events this year, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a cruel murder of yeah. one trans girl, and uh, we could uh, we could we witnessed the the uh, media uh, reporting and uh, uh, social media comments and uh, a lot of really really tough things for us. So maybe it's it's really time to together uh, us all activists to think together about uh, fighting back because I, I and I am I'm agreed with uh, Adriana this is um, this is not a movement this is a mobiliz mobilization mm -hmm. and um, some answer from our side is is really needed but uh, I just have to say one thing uh, even in, in this particular question uh, activists for for human rights are m always fair but we are fair in this question mostly because we are not talking about anti-gender ideology we call them movement not but their ideology because mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not real it's something that is in invented mm -hmm. and uh, after all when you're when you're talking about the ideologies uh, the goal is always the same dehumanizing everything and everyone yeah. and to talk about us like a product of social engineering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. And uh, uh, maybe to uh, zoom out uh, from the Serbian context a bit. Uh, and uh, I would like to come back to you, Adriana, and ask you, uh, describe the, uh, this uh, anti-gender uh, uh, discourse and uh, ideology, uh, how Anna just uh, called it as a transnational movement but what we have here uh, is often it's somehow um, packaged in Serbia into some sort of a wider anti-western discourse whereby uh, what is branded as gender ideology is presented as part of that discourse as you say uh, we have exactly the same uh, anti-gender ideology in the West so, you know, how does this work? I mean, take this country, the influences in this sense uh, coming from abroad. Do they come more from the East, from the West, uh, both? Uh, because we could see groups from both the West and East and these courses infiltrate the domestic public discourse as well. Well, you posed many questions which I are know. all relevant. <laughs> all relevant. Uh, I will start from the question of language, which I think is enormously important. And the fact is that we rarely read in uh, Hungarian, Bulgarian, Romanian, Polish. Mm -hmm. If we did, we would see words or sentences even, verbatim, appearing in different kinds of languages or in different kinds of nation-state contexts. We think it's a national thing. Poles think it's their Polish thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even the French thing, it's a French thing, which started with Manif Portu in, in 2012, and it really started there for the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's France, you know, like a very Western country, mm -hmm. where we have the first anti-gender mobilizations, let's say, campaigns. 
at that time. But what I want to stress is that if we manage to follow the trace of, of the discourse around anti-gender, if we do research and compare mm -hmm. with colleagues, mm -hmm. then you see that somehow uh, there is a great similarity uh, or even sameness of which we are not aware simply because we are in our own context yeah, very that's often. Really interesting, yes, yes. Yes, and I think that this shows us very simply how transnational the mobilizations, rather, the movement is always troublesome. You somehow think there is some kind of social movement which is comparable to feminist and LGBT movement, mm -hmm. and there are now two movements clashing, although that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Why that's not the case? Because the actors, this is something to which I did not respond when you asked in the, mm -hmm. first, in the first place, the actors are not some kind of you know, street campaigners. Of course, there are protests, and this is also one of one of the anti-gender ways of mobilizing. But that's not the only one. The actors are also governments. Mm. Think of Poland again. Mm -hmm. Think of Hungary mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Think of Italy at the moment with mm -hmm. with uh, the current president. So, or Bolsonaro's Brazil, or mm -hmm. now maybe even Argentina, mm -hmm. in which anti-abortion is a huge issue from the very start. Mm -hmm. So we have. Very strong. Think of Trump. Mm. <laughs> Let's think about who were the generators and maintainers of the discourse. Mm -hmm. Then there is churches. Mm -hmm. We always think about Roman Catholic Church in the first place, and really the Roman Catholic, the, 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 the countries in which Roman Catholicism is the dominant religion, they were m more susceptible to anti gender mm -hmm. ideology or we see a more developed form, such mm -hmm. as Croatia in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. or Slovenia. Mm -hmm. However, it seems that also other countries, either those like Czechia, where religion is not the main motor in society, or Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, North Mon uh, Macedonia, mm -hmm. in which we have orthodoxy, following the in the in the lead of Russia, which by the way, I on the way here I saw that Russia just yes. uh, banned LGBTQI international movement uh, and proclaimed it an extremist uh, organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, what is an LGBTQI international movement as an organization. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, you, we see that a lot of terminology in the end that we use either as social movement theorists or as political scientists or sociologists so kind of missing out on something because it's, it's much bigger than um, just your other social mm. movements, so to say. You mentioned countries where, you know, maybe religion is not prevalent topic and political topic in the society or topic in general. So uh, let's, if we focus on Serbia, in the late 2000s, we have um, seen the emergence of certain political parties and groups that tried uh, to find the space for themselves on the right by espousing this for Serbia, a sort of new political ideology and discourse, which would be, uh, you know, anti-gender, anti-whatever that comprises, abortion. So in some ways trying to replicate Western political uh, topics, minus the atavistic nationalism from the 1990s. I'm talking, for example, of very movement, you know, when it started. But then what's really interesting for me is over in the course of this decade, they came back to the, um, to the nationalism from the 1990s. So I was wondering, does this tell us something about the salience of anti-gender ideology in Serbia politically? What, like, is it, uh, because we still see it, and in many shapes and forms, but then, you know, their attempt to kind of find a niche for themselves in only talking about this somehow failed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, can we, does this tell us something or not? Well, <laughs> I, it's really, I, I will be really short about this. Yeah. Uh, political parties and elites in Serbia are uh, so immature that mm -hmm. they're not, they cannot, uh, 
go on the f- next level and our politics uh, working like this. Okay, everything is falling apart, so let's hate someone. In the 90s, we hated uh, Croatians. In the 2000s, we hated uh, Albanians. And now we are hating LGBT plus community in total mm-hmm. because we have to hate someone. Mm-hmm. When, when there is someone to hate, everything looks better because somehow we are guilty for the uh, poor economic uh, standards uh, for uh, Kosovo, for uh, uh, any problem that harms society in total. So uh, let's just ride on that wave and everything is going to be better. So we have many topos, topoi of, of the discussion of today in the 1990s. So we have anti-abortion campaign in 93. We have this idea, mm-hmm. you know, Majka Jugovića, uh, mm-hmm. the mother of, of the heroes Jugovići from the Kosovo battle era. Uh, we also uh, have a very strong anti emancipationist discourse, which was also anti-socialist discourse because the socialism was seen as something which emancipated women and gave them too many freedoms. Mm. Uh, But then we also had a very strong anti-LGBT or rather LG at that time uh, discourse, which was even beyond thinking or debate. Um, so there is a continuation and of course there is a package of nationalism or ultra conservatism uh, which then we have we have also we can also trace it by the end of as you said the end of 2000s at the time when the first law on the equality of sexes back then was an anti-discrimination the first of its kind law were um, uh, ratified (laughs) in 2000 as i say nine and which was at the same time an imperative for for serbia because it was uh, with that that we got white schengen it seems to me that society is evolving uh maybe in general not in a bad direction but that these political parties are like grasping for the straws in the movements and trying to find their place, as Anna said, in some sort of uh, anti-something uh, positioning. And because we also see like some other right-wing parties that, uh, uh, you know, in the seeming that incorporate uh, elements of the anti-gender ideology in a seemingly feminist discourse. You know, think about certain female right-wing political leaders who talk about reproductive rights and about uh, incentivizing uh, reproductive rights uh, for women, but not in the sense that you would think as a right, but as something that would boot, uh, boost uh, Uh, natality growth, for example. I wonder, you know, um, are they, uh, will the, I know it's hard to predict, but will the finale, should we be optimist or pessimist in the sense, will the finality be that they will adapt uh, to the new realities of the society and uh, render their ideology uh, ideology kind of less uh, aggressive? Or do they have the capacity to turn the whole society around, this would be the pessimistic scenario and kind of uh, lead us back to some 1990s 2.0 in that sense. 1990s in a way are still here and it always will be here. We we can remember and recall everything from 20 or 30 years ago and we can, we witness that some elites from then are uh, in the European way uh, in a sense and they're uh, promoting european values which wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago Mm -hmm. so everything can change here Mm -hmm. but only uh, um, in a way of speaking right not in a way of not in a way of doing things Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this really makes serbia a very very specific country I mean, mm-hmm. not only in Europe, but everywhere. Uh, because we are the only country that is, as of this moment, having uh, a lesbian prime minister. Mm-hmm. And in a way, it also uh, gives support to what Anna said, that 
um, there is no truthfulness in or desire to really implement a certain politics. If in 2009 that these laws, which are fundamental for a certain kind of fight for emancipation or for, for gender equality, uh, if that was not um, brought there as a kind in a truthful way and with a desire to really implement that, but to in a way play a tactical Europeanization card, mm -hmm. then of course you you make your opposition or the opposition to that idea very strong, mm -hmm. and that opposition plays around the idea that that's West. And that's European values. Mm -hmm. And if those are the European values, we don't want them. Mm -hmm. What do we want? Well, we want something traditional, something really Serbian. What that really is, nobody tells us. We don't know whether, I think that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether that's Serbia from 1920s or 1870s or 1820s or before. We don't have a clue of what exactly is a traditional Serbian man, woman, family, values, children, nothing of that. Mm -hmm. We just know that that's not the West. And you mentioned Veri. Veri is a sister party of IFD Alternative for Deutschland. So, I mean, there are also people promoting and articulating these ideas in the center of the West or in right. the heart of the West. Right, in the heart of Europe, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe uh, to bring Europe and Serbia in this context. Uh, last year, Belgrade was the center of an international LGBT plus uh, event, Europe Pride 2022. This also brings me to the mention of the prime minister and the ruling party. And, uh, and on this example, I believe at least, we could see how anti-gender anti campaigns can have a mobilizing potential uh, because uh, 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 considering that uh, because of the discourse and everything months before the Euro Pride we had majority of the population declare themselves against that event even some people that I personally know that absolutely do not harbor anti-LGBT uh, uh, feelings somehow got mobilized by this uh, thing and uh, such uh, uh, sentiment in the population prompted uh, the government for electoral reasons, the president to kind of cancel or whatever that was, uh, the Europe Pride 2022. So uh, can you tell us a bit how did the event go in the end, uh, what it meant for you? Uh, was it a success that it went uh, and, uh, and and maybe you know compare it to the uh, event this year that wasn't uh, Europe Pride but uh, just Belgrade Pride and that went <laughs> completely almost unnoticed had the participation bigger than ever I would argue no fans hooligans protesting against it so this is a very interesting dynamic um. In the beginning of the conversation, uh, uh, you said, and that is, of course, the fact that we are uh, giving a free um, uh, psychological and legal support to our survivors. Yes. And uh, but on the because we are evidencing and uh, documenting the cases uh, of uh, unlawful conduct towards LGBT plus community in Serbia. Uh, we reporting about that in our annual report. Uh, this was the sixth, and uh, uh, the report was uh, uh, finished in I think May or June. But we wanted to wait uh, for the Pride this year to see how it's going and what is going to happen with all those discrimination and hate speech that we had last year. And uh, this year was. Um, very, very uh, quiet. Mm -hmm. No one had nothing to say about pride. N n uh, neither Dveri, neither Zavetnici. Uh, but last year it was um, that that was a crazy roller coaster yeah. of uh, 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 hate speech from them. And um, and we can see how uh, anti gender movement uh, works on the Euro Pride, and we are uh, we are treating Euro Pride like in the case study 
because we had uh, two months before the the the, the event itself um, every day uh, media spinning uh, of TV debates of texts in in printing media on the web on the social media uh, if you look uh, on the comments uh, mostly on YouTube after the TV duels but of both sides there there is like a hate speech uh, in a tons Uh, mostly on YouTube, uh, some in in the less uh, proportion in the on the Instagram or Facebook, but that was um, that was organized, that was paid, and we can see that this year there was no money for that, mm-hmm. so no one had nothing against mm-hmm. that kind of homophobia and transphobia that we uh, faced last year. It was very hard yeah. for us, for us, for our families, for our movement, for the whole community, uh, for our colleagues, and everyone was shocked, scared. You know, when when you're facing something like that, you don't know what is going to happen. Is there going to be like a civil war about the, that one day, or is going to be like just that one little little walk of, of, on a on a few hundred meters yeah. um, and uh, of course the messages from the government was like uh, there was four uh, four Saturdays four Sundays uh, I'm sorry four Sundays uh, that the president was giving the statements and one one Sunday was like uh, everything is fine I in my personal family have close relative and I'm strongly Uh, supporting then next I'm strongly against and that was uh, the, the that, that was the roller coaster of, of his uh, yes. this is the president opinions. in yeah. power with, yes with the lesbian prime minister but in 2010 when the president was in the opposition we had almost civil war mm-hmm. yes because it was convenient uh, for yes. the party to but have that was that is that part of uh, yeah. uh, political elites and their Im- right. immature behavior right right, right. coming yeah. back to the yeah but this is a real life we are living here and this is our real life and so our real struggle that's the problem so this cannot be the the, the object of that kind of uh, mixed messages and uh, uh, internal politics and uh, is so tough and so cruel for us mm. but well, yes. if i can add something because I somehow started with uh, our prime minister and <clears> then <throat> did not develop that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but this also gives us an, an, an insight into how gender ideology as a trope works because it is um, it's it's not a politics in itself it's a it's a useful device it's a very important powerful useful device so for example uh, in 2017 as you mentioned at the very start of our talk Uh, there was a, a ban of the very important packages and it was the first time in April 2017 when the, the notion or the concept of gender ideology, rodne ideology, appeared in Serbian language. And then somehow with, the, with the, how fast all of that happened, uh, the appearance of several public intellectuals of the rightist provenience Uh, uh, and somehow how, how that steered the society, the public debate or the society, and then also the Ministry of Education, uh, took us to think that that might, you know, bring us the new prime minister who's going to be a real right-wing side of the governing party. Mm. However, what happened was that Anna Brnabic became the prime minister just two months after that. It was really kind of confounding what is going on. We know that despite the fact that uh, she is the prime minister, so the most powerful personality, politically speaking, in the country, that still, despite her own personal life developing in a family way, Mm -hmm. she did not do anything to have other lives of other people enhanced. And that does not only uh, refer to LGBT plus 
mm. people, but generally lives of people mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. But um, then we have the situation that once it's opportune, and that is last year with Europe Pride, once it's politically opportune to somehow suppress this idea of using the lesbian, open lesbian prime minister as a West, as something that you sell to the West as your model of doing politics, of your openness, of your Euro Europeanization already. It was opportune to use Europe Pride and to simply erase the real lives of people and to use this politics at that moment and the gender discourses to uh, let the genie out of the bottle of your uh, Serbian Orthodox Church, which was very silent in the years prior to uh, 2022, mm -hmm. somehow also captured, like gender equality was captured through the prime minister, and then nobody could really do something. Well, you have your prime minister. I mean, you, you have a woman, you have a lesbian. What would you want more in terms of gender mm -hmm. or LGBTQ mm -hmm. equality? And then last year somehow showed us how that can be used and misused and then uh, forgotten in a moment. Mm. So that's why I'm saying somehow anti-gender really functions as, as a very useful, as a very useful uh, tool for grouping or regrouping uh, your political enemies, your political needs. And of course, it functions differently in different countries. Ours is very specific because we are really somehow from the outside, we are looking as a dream come true for gender equality. Mm. But the real dream come true, can I ask you maybe one last question to both of you with the risk of opening a Pandora's box, but that's not my intention. So we hear 2030 as a date uh, where Serbia may be well enter into the European Union with other Western Balkans countries, however hard it is for us to believe that. And uh, But when will be the date, in your opinion, and what conditions need to be met that when we will all be equal to come back to uh, uh, Adriana's opening uh, statements? We have that chapter, a uh, very particular one, chapter 23 mm -hmm. uh, regarding human rights and I think that we are not on the best position in that in, in sense that we are uh, we are not doing as much as we can or as, as, as we should uh, in the sense of uh, laws on human rights we don't have a law on same-sex partnership we don't have a law I, I'm speaking about my part of the um, from the LGBT plus community right. standing. Uh, we don't have the law of same sex partnership uh, and we don't have a law of uh, gender identity. Uh, the same sex partnership uh, law is drafted and uh, waiting in some drawer to be uh, presented in the, in, in the parliament. And uh, when it comes to gender identity law, we don't have nothing. So, um, from that point of view, we are not we are not near, um, but always is the same thing. If there is a political will, there is going to be uh, an, a huge step up. Twenty thirty, well, uh, the struggle well, continues. Or first, I I wish that EU exists in twenty thirty, mm -hmm. <laughs> because when it comes to gender and what we we're talking about. Poland, Hungary, but now also Netherlands, they're all in, in EU and uh, Netherlands, one of the most constitutive countries of EU. However, with the politics now, which is not exactly uh, what we here perceive as the European values, and mm -hmm. for that reason attack them and want not to be in touch mm -hmm. with them. I have one very pessimistic and one optimistic message. Mm -hmm. uh, a pessimistic one is that I think that th this is bigger than the 90s, not in Serbia, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. I really think that uh, the social tissue has been changed in the last 30, 40, 50 years, and that there were always backlashes, mm -hmm. uh, always some kind of reactions to that kind of emancipation of the society. Uh, 
Uh, however, now I think it's it's the real one. It's not like smaller backlashes. It's a real one. It's a uh, it's on all levels, and we really see it in all pores of the society. So from that point of view, uh, it is it's like empire strikes back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not easy, and that does not give us too much space for enthusiasm. On the other hand, and this is where I want to be an optimist. It is the real lives of real people that matter. And these people, I mean, the emancipated people, women, men, and everyone in between, will not just give up on their lives. And that's it. Mm. It's, it's not going to be so easy to somehow, you know, sit there and wait in order for the empire to come back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hoping that the empire doesn't come back, we end this episode of the Lighthouse <laughs> Podcast. Thank you, Adriana and Anna. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.